Well, I, I don't know what to say about the next speaker. I've, I've probably been to as close to this guy as anybody could be as close to anybody. Um, and uh, uh, that would be me. So um, I've written a few. I've been studying the role of cannabis in history for a little over 20 years. I've written a few books on the subject, uh, Green Gold, The Tree of Life, Marijuana, and Magic and Religion, which came out in 1995. Uh, in 2001, I had uh, Sex, Drugs, Violence in the Bible come out with my good friend Neil McQueen, uh, all about the uh, references to cannabosum uh, and the use of cannabis in biblical incenses and anointing oils. And then more recently, I uh, had the uh, book Cannabis and the Soma Solution come out. And so uh, in, in looking at that through that material over the years, I've noticed that there is some really fascinating archaeological discoveries, which really give uh, an element of... Uh, real solid truth to uh, the role of cannabis in human history. And we can speculate on a lot of things like uh, Ted did about how man first came to contact with cannabis, probably uh, looking for food and discovering its protein rich seeds and getting the sticky resins on their hand. Uh, um, but uh, archeological takes it beyond speculation and into an area of, uh, of solid reality. Um, in far regards to cannabis, the oldest evidence we have of like hemp fiber is probably from like about 12,000 years ago in Taiwan. But uh, more recent uh, research, taking a look at the tools uh, used in the decordation of hemp, put cannabis uh, uh, hemp uh, fiber uh, making tools back to about 30,000 years. And this falls into uh, close into the range of uh, what's known as the uh, great leap forward when man started discovering things like tool making and the fire, uh, things like that, and really, really, really started to evolve culturally. Um, and uh, it, uh, Dr. Guy, Jeffrey Guy from GW Pharmaceuticals and uh, um, John McPartland, uh, um, they recently had, had a, a paper out about uh, how the endocannabinoid system in humanity uh, coming into contact with the, uh, uh, the, the cannabinoids in cannabis may have uh, facilitated this great leap forward by creating new areas of association in the human brain, uh, you know, leading to things like tool making and whatnot. Um, so some pretty fascinating stuff there, but unfortunately um, plant matter doesn't really survive a lot really well archaeologically So a lot of uh, uh, what we have to look at is for burnt cannabis and in regards to uh, burnt cannabis and evidence of cannabis is used for psychoactive uh, purposes the late archaeologist Andrew Sherratt of the Ashmolean Museum at the University of Oxford pointed to the use of cannabis incense at grave sites of a group known as the Proto-Indo-Europeans, the Kurgans, that uh, refers to the types of grave sites they had, who occupied what is now Romania 5,000 years ago. The discovery of a smoking cup which contained remnants of charred hemp seeds at the site documents that 3,500 years before Christ, humanity had already been using cannabis for religious purposes for millennia and is the early evi earliest evidence for the burning of cannabis. Parts of the plant, namely leaves and flowers, flowers had been consumed and the carbonized hard shell-like residue of the seeds left behind. The authors of the Encyclopedia of Indo-European Cultures note that hemp has not only been recovered from sites in Romania but also from a yama burial at Gerbernaci in Moldova where traces were found in a sensor, a shallow footed bowl believed to have been used in the burning of some aromatic substance. It has been found in similar content from an early Bronze Age burial in the North Caucasus. Uh, to quote uh, Andrew Sherratt, it seems therefore that the practice of burning cannabis as a narcotic is a tradition which goes back in this area for some five or six thousand years and was the focus of the social and religious rituals of the pastoral people of central Eurasia in prehistoric and early historic times. And uh, this is again from the Encyclopedia of Indo-European Culture. So this is in, uh, material coming from you know people writing about pot. These are in bigger books about actual history and uh, anthropology. Uh, um, these sensors, often highly decorated with some birth motifs, are widespread across the ste steppes region, and in the third millennia BC, extending at least from the Dinapar to the Yenesi, and part of a ritual complex. The sensors all diff so diffuse westward at this time in Romania, Hungary, and further along the Danube. And so this is the style of a uh, sensor that they're talking about in, in these types of uh, uh, studies uh, that were used for the burning of hemp. Uh, Andrew Sherratt suggested that, can that, that the cannabis burning braziers eventually went to the wayside and were replaced by a beverage, uh, uh, although he believes that cannabis use continued through this cultural shift. The, quote, disappearance of ceramic brazers in northern and western Europe 
was followed by the appearance of prominent forms of pottery drinking vessels. Corded ware beakers and earlier bell beakers are ornamented with the impressions of twisted cords. If these are hemp fibers, then the decoration may indicate that their contents were connected with cannabis. Charette uh, 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 had the view that uh, was held by a lot of other researchers, and this is again uh, in concordance with Charette's view of the Encyclopedia of Indo-European Cultures. As cannabis can also be infused, i.e. served as a component in a drink, it has also been suggested that the spread of, all, uh, of cord hemp decorated pottery from the steppes westward may also have been a part of this same complex. So uh, this is an example of the type of corded ware uh, that they're talking about, and they would have pressed the hemp cords into the, 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 the clay to get those decorative uh, markings on them. And this is the extent of the corded ware culture. So uh, basically what uh, Sherat and these other people are saying is that at first, you know, about five, 6,000 years ago, people were burning cannabis in uh, the uh, Eurasia. Uh, but then uh, um, at some point they converted it into this drink, drinking beverage. And this was uh, uh, placed into these uh, vessels that were uh, decorated with hemp cords. And uh, to make uh, uh, an argument for his point, he used the example of uh, these types of vessels here that were uh, made into the shapes of poppies in order to depict that they actually contained opium containing beverages. Celtic use of cannabis has also been identified through pollen analysis uh, of a bowl from a rich woman's grave at, of the late Hallstatt period of the 8th to 6th century B uh, BC in Bavaria, uh, and the authors of the Encyclopedia of Indo-European Culture likewise note that hemp has been discovered in an Iron Age context in Western Europe, LG the Hallstatt burial, presumably Celtic, at H Hochstorf in Germany. Other Cel Celtic evidence of cannabis, cannabis is evidenced by reports of hemp fi fibers from objects recovered at St. Andrews in Scotland. So this use was considerably widespread throughout Europe. As the authors of the exhaustive Encyclopedia of Indo-European Culture have noted, there are at least three chronological horizons to which the spread of hemp might be ascribed. The early distribution of hemp across Europe during the Neolithic 5000 BC or earlier, a later spread of hemp for presumably narcotic purposes around 3000 BC, a still later spread or at least re-emergence of hemp in the content of the textiles during the first millennium BC. Much of the early spread of cannabis throughout the ancient world is largely attributed to a group of Indo-European tribes who originated along the Russian steppes and are now often collectively known under the name of Scythian. As descendants of the first horse riders, these highly nomadic tribes were able to spread both linguistics and myths about cannabis far and wide. These, this original spread can still be seen in the study of the origins of many of the names of cannabis throughout the world. To quote the late great anthropologist Weston Labar, all the Indo-European languages have dialectically equivalent terms for hemp. Anglo-Saxon hanap, Middle English hemp, Danish and uh, Middle Low German hanap, Icelandic hampar, Swedish hampa, German hampf, Polish konop, Bohemian konop, Old Bulgarian and Russian konople, Lithuanian kanapes, Let Lettish kanepe, Irish canib, Persian quinob, Greek cannabis, Latin cannabis, French chambre, and Sanskrit kana. That these terms are manifest and dialectic equivalents would constitute the solidest possible evidence for the entire and then placed into a vessel set within the shelter. In Scythia, they grow hemp, and then the cysts take some of, this, of its seeds, creep under the felt altar, uh, uh, scatter it, and scatter the seeds over the hot stones, which give off great clouds of steam that any Greek st steam bath, the cysts delighted in the steam and are, are loudly exultant. So probably what Herodotus is referring to is actually seeded buds and uh, um, uh, what was thrown onto the rocks were these seeded buds and this thing was kind of like a, a, a prehistoric vaporizer, uh, red hot stones and uh, the cannabis throwing on it and then uh, collected in this uh, small tent-like uh, 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 um, setup. It is most likely that the seeds described by Herodotus were seeded buds and the charred carbonide seen seeds later found by archaeologists what was left from the burnt seeds. It is also worth mentioning Herodotus also described people living on islands who meet together in companies, throw cannabis on a fire and then sit around in a circle and by inhaling the fruit that has been thrown on it, they become intoxicated by the odor just as the Greeks do by wine and more fruit is thrown on it, the more intoxicated they become until they rise up and dance and 
betake themselves to singing. Now, the Russian archaeologist Sergio Redunko dug up material proof of Herodotus' claims in the 1940s in his excavation of a Scythian tome of a Scythian warrior king. Uh, this is like actually, uh, uh, they, they found his mummified remains, and this is a reproduction of the tattoos uh, that this uh, in, pretty uh, majestic figure had on him. This guy was about six foot two, uh, died in battle, at, and he was like supposed to be about like in his 60s when he died, but he was still, you know, in his 60s, a formidable warrior going out into the battlefield, you know, and uh, um, the Scythians had no written language, so a lot of their mythology and stuff were, was tattooed onto their bodies. Uh, um, and accompanying him in the afterlife, along with the gold, horses, and other artifacts, was all the paraphernalia for his use of cannabis into the afterlife. Uh, so there we see the uh, bronze uh, uh, um, braziers that had the heated rocks placed into them. Here is the, uh, uh, the setup for the TP structure. So these would have uh, been placed in the center of the structure with the heated rocks, a uh, carpet placed over this uh, 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 stick setup, and then uh, cannabis put into the hot rocks, and then they would open up the, uh, the, the, the carpet enough to put their head in and uh, take a uh, hot box, like Cynthia was mentioning. So this is a primitive uh, hot box uh, setup that we have here. As uh, Rudenko describes the, of the hemp burning implements, in each vessel beside the stones, as already mentioned above, there was a small quantity of seeds of hemp, cannabis sativa L, the variety C, ruderalis janich. Burning hot stones had been placed in the sensor and part of the hemp seeds had been charred. Furthermore, the handle of the cauldron sensor had been bound with birch bark, evidently because the heat of the stones was such that the handles became too hot to hold in the bare hands. The widespread discovery of these braziers at cannabis Scythians, Scythians, uh, and cannabis at Scythian sites indicates that the use of cannabis was a common occurrence amongst them and not something limited to burial rites. So uh, here we again see some Scythians in a modern depiction there inhaling the, the fumes of cannabis and uh, a close up of some of the types of braziers that we're talking about here. Another Scythian find, here are the remains of an immaculately dressed princess aged around uh, 25 and preserved for several millennia in the Siberian permafrost, a natural uh, freezer, were discovered in 1993 by Novosibirsk scientist Natalie Polmask during an archaeological expedition. Uh, oh, there's another Scythian there. <laughs> and so this is this new find of this Scythian princess here. Uh, this is what they suspect that it looked like when she was uh, laid to rest initially. Uh, this is, you can see her tattoos a little more clearly in this picture. And here again, we can see the reproduction of her uh, tattoos uh, uh, slightly more clearly. Uh, um, buried uh, around her were six horses, saddled and bridled, her spiritual escorts to the next world, and a symbol of her evident status, perhaps more likely uh, a, 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 post, perhaps most likely a revered folktale narrator, a healer or a holy woman than an ice princess and again a small container of cannabis. Amongst other uh, related finds uh, in Scythian tomes, this is a bag that contained cannabis. Uh, this was a uh, depiction of a horn cup that was uh, said to contain uh, uh, cannabis residue. Um, so they were drinking it as well as burning it. And it's important to note that um, uh, similar to the transition that happened in uh, Eurasia with the uh, braziers uh, into the corded ware, uh, the Scythians uh, uh, began to uh, drink cannabis a lot more. And the cups they made were made to look like the braziers that they had burned it in. Um, and uh, uh, in order to you know kind of make the connection culturally and uh, uh, this is a uh, item of interest that I hadn't seen before I put the I was collecting images for, for putting to this together and it's from a, an exhibit in a New York University and is described as a pipe with eight pebbles uh, found at a Scythian uh, site at Barrel and it had burnt cannabis seeds and remnants in it and so uh, um, this is apparently a pipe. I'm not sure, it, uh, uh, maybe they heated the rocks up and placed the cannabis in there and took a hit off either end or maybe one guy blew and gave the old shotgun uh, um, or uh, hard, hard, to t yeah, hard to take, so maybe like a to super toke hole or whatnot. But they say this is actually a primitive pipe. And if it is a primitive pipe and not a brazier uh, like these other uh, objects, it changes the whole history of pipe smoking uh, in the old world because 
generally the, uh, the accepted theory is that pipe smoking of cannabis came via the New World uh, use of tobacco uh, pipes and uh, uh, came in and then filtered into the cannabis world. So uh, th if, if that is, is the case. Well, vaporizing, yeah, it is a, yeah, it is a, vaporize, a vaporizer. So uh, that's the uh, vaporized, the uh, volcano 2300, uh, B, uh, 2300 years ago, uh, 300 BC. That one's uh, 400 uh, BC. Yeah so, yeah, so there you go. That's right. Um, and uh, here's an agent Scythian uh, traveling on his horse, and he's got his brazier on the back there for a handy, so he's ready to party and uh, take, take this, his cannabis knowledge and his cannabis wherever he goes. Uh, um, as noted, their early domestication of the horse led to the wide distribution of Western, to Western culture. Most recent archaeological discoveries document that the penetration into Central Asia, China, uh, along with their use of cannabis, as discussed by Mark. So uh, these Scythians uh, were related to the mummy that Mark was discussing in his uh, uh, um, uh, topic there. And here's a close-up of the mummy. Uh, there's his burial site. This is the bag that had over two pounds of uh, female cannabis in it that was uh, processed. Uh, a depiction of uh, one of the cannabis seeds. And then this is a bowl that would have been used for grinding cannabis and so heavily used that it actually had holes in it. Uh, there's the depictions of uh, the, the bag that contained the cannabis in the bowl. Uh, this is a close up of the cannabis that was found. Unfortunately, the seeds weren't viable after uh, 2,700 years in the permafrost, although apparently they, they did try to sprout some. And uh, that's actually a picture of the cannabis with uh, you know, resin glands and uh, uh, whatnot still on it. And there's another close-up of the uh, tome that the uh, shaman was found in. Okay, and uh, then it also reached into uh, the Karakum de Desert region. Uh, 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 Dr. Aldrich was referring to the Bactria Margiana region there in his discussion. And uh, through the work of this Russian archaeologist, Victor Sarianati, we've really come across what may be one of the most important uh, discoveries uh, of, of an ancient site in regards to the history of religion. Uh, Sarianati, uh, 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 this is, this is uh, in the deep, deep, uh, deeper parts of Afghanistan, getting closer to Russia, uh, that he discovered this uh, temple complex. And there's a, uh, a reconstruction of the temple and its layout that he found. Uh, close up of that, so this is this is what they suspect it looked like. Apparently, this uh, temple, which was you know larger than a football field, half of this temple uh, site was dedicated to making this sacred beverage, uh, which uh, Sarianati says was the uh, uh, Zoroastrian Haoma. And uh, um, uh, in digging around there, uh, this is the site itself. Uh, he came across a number of vessels and pots that he says were used in the preparation of soma. Um, on the, uh, and a few uh, substances have been indicated by this archaeological find, those being poppy, cannabis, and ephedra. And uh, uh, on the right-hand side in the center there, those little pillar, uh, little tubes there with the eyes on them are actually bone tubes that were used for the consumption of opium. Um, but below that, there's a vessel there that would have been used for the straining of the Haoma. At first, it was uh, beaten with rocks, with water, uh, um, or in some cases, milk. And then it was uh, placed into this sieve over here, which would have had uh, a wool uh, hair cloth placed over it. And then the uh, um, material was uh, strained through it. And uh, up there, mark number three is actually uh, um, material that fossilized in these pots and uh, left the impression of certain seeds. And here we can see uh, that these are seeds of cannabis by the uh, shape of them and cannabis ephedra and poppy grow all around this ancient world site. Um, and they also tested this sediment at the time uh, and found that it, it was in fact cannabis, although later tests were less successful because the material had oxidized. And uh, here, this, I put this picture in here because it just goes show, uh, shows the, 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 
length of time that this type of process regarding cannabis uh, um, lasted, because this here is about uh, uh, 4,000 years later. Uh, this is from an 18th century uh, painting called Fakir's Prepared Bong. Bong, of course, being the cannabis beverage uh, prepared in India and the Mideast. And in the lower right-hand side, we see a individual stripping the cannabis from the uh, 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 plant matter right there off of the stalk. Uh, 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 Mid-left, uh, uh, we, we see the guys with the three bowls there. They're actually mixing cannabis with water or milk. Uh, um, and then in the center of the picture is a sieve uh, that was used for straining the cannabis uh, and uh, uh, getting out the uh, psychoactive properties into the milk or, or water, whatever they decided to use. And in the lower left, we see a guy who could not wait and decided to hit the bomb. And uh, uh, um, showing that not only the technique uh, for uh, uh, preparing cannabis had lasted for thousands of years, but actually its association with the Heoma. Uh, this is a, some depictions from a, a 19th century article that was uh, brought to our attention by Michael Horowitz's, uh, uh, what was that uh, book called that you, you published this in uh, with all the, no, this was like the uh, compendium. Oh, right. Okay, there you go. That, yeah. The Dope Chronicles, which was a collection of 19th, 18th century uh, cannabis newspaper articles. And this was one of those articles called Orgies of the Hemp Eaters. And uh, it describes a cannabis uh, ritual in which they prepare a cannabis beverage. And it still was known at that time under the name Homa. Uh, okay, just one second here. And, you know, uh, um, in regards to my own personal theory of, uh, uh, of cannabis and soma, um, you know, originating with soma, soma eventually became a, uh, a blanket term that referred to a variety of psychoactives that were used in uh, ritual context, and the consecration is what, what made them soma. But I would suggest that it originated uh, with a cannabis cult, and the, uh, the uh, dialectic that led to that uh, connection would be that the, you know, the mummies up in China, which uh, Mark referred to uh, in his study, in which I was just looking at there, uh, in China, cannabis is known as Huma, and then that would have filtered into the uh, temple area that I was discussing of Serenati's find, becoming li linguistically Heoma, and then this filtered into uh, um, India becoming Soma, and this was all gathered by the Scythians, who were also known by another name, the Heoma Varga, the Heoma Gatherers. Uh, um, so we see a pretty strong association with cannabis in all those areas uh, and through that lineage. In Mesopotamia, we do not have evidence of actual plant matter as of yet and have to rely on cuneiform texts and their translations. And some of the early names for cannabis in Assyria and Sumeria include Sumerian Azala, Assyrian Azulu, being English cannabis. Sumerian uh, Samanisiti, Assyrian Azulu, English for drug for grief. Sumerian Ganzaguna, Assyrian Azulu, uh, English hemp for Persian cognate Ganja. Ganzi Gunanu has also been translated as the drug that takes away the mind. Sumerian Guguru, Assyrian Azulura, English Hashish the drug that takes away the pain as well as the evil spirit afflicting the victim. Disease was often interpreted as a form of possession in the ancient world, so the, uh, the association that would be taking a spirit away in, uh, uh, in healing pain would, wouldn't be unrealistic. By the eighth century, however, cannabis came to be known under the term kanubu, and this is likely due to new sources of the herb coming available via the East Iranians who knew it as Kanaba via Scythian traders and an adoption of their name Cannabis. And this filtered into the Assyrian dialect as Kanubu. King Assurbanipal, who lived between the 7th and 6th century BC, had recipes for hashish under this name. And they are thought to be copied down from even more ancient texts. Uh, um, from accounts, it is uh, from Assyrian accounts, it is clear that the oil, fiber, and medicinal spiritual qualities of hemp were well known. And in regards to medical applications, numbers of medical applications of cannabis, along with other plant components, are prescribed in the agent Assyrian cuneiform tablets. Things such as epilepsy, known as hand of ghost, and as an aid in childbirth, depression of spirits. Uh, if he eats this plant, he will have no sorrows. Uh, um, cannabis was used uh, with the plant L in an oil to anoint swellings and was also employed as a simple poultice. 
It was often employed in Mesopotamia to relieve the pain of bronchitis, bladder trouble, rheumatism, and as a remedy for insomnia. And, and these are actual Assyrian uh, medical tablets that refer to uh, cannabis. Possible indications of recreational use may even be indicated. Cannabis was cited as a drink for unknown purposes, as uh, noted by the pioneering Assyriologist Reginald Campbell Thompson. In regards to spiritual use, a 4,000-year-old inscription in the temple documents of the third dynasty of Ur from Uma has, an, has an inscribed a memoranda of three regular offerings of hemp and, and also in a letter written in 680 BC to the mother of the Assyrian king Esarhaddon, references made to Kanaba in response to Esarhaddon's mother's questions as to what is used in the sacred rite. A high priest, Nella Sharini, responded that the main item for the rites are fine oil, water, honey, odorous plants, and cannabis. Uh, this is a depiction of King uh, Esarhaddon here, and uh, uh, in front of him he has a incense tent. And there's a little like uh, a fancier version of the Scythian thing here uh, with a little area where there he can put his head into and inhale the burning fumes. And behind him is uh, what has been referred to as the Syrian tree of life and has also been connected with Haoma. And no known uh, um, descriptions exist in the Assyrian literature as to what this actual symbol of this sacred tree symbolized. And it's interesting that no symbols for cannabis exist in Assyria. It's only known by name. So there may be some connection there, and I've uh, looked at that in my books. Um, from accounts, it is clear, uh, okay, just for a second here. Uh, Assyrius, and then, okay, Assyriologist Erica Reiner writes that uh, the multi-faceted uh, goddess Ishara she does not appear to be a native to a Mesopotamian deity, but was worshipped by many people throughout the ancient Near East, which has led to a confusing array of attributions. She is known as the great goddess to the Hurrians, the wife of Dagon among the Semites, and to the Akkadians, she was known as the goddess of love with close affinities to Ishtar, whose sacred plants, cannabis, Kanubu, was known as the aromatic of Ishera. From her widespread worship, she is also known as the queen of the inhabited world. And uh, in relation to cannabis as an aromatic of the goddess, it's interesting to note that Konabo was an ingredient in a perfume and recipes as a female personal name for hippocoristeric, a term of endearment. And so this is a depiction of Ishira, and it, the, the name Ishira is thought to actually be of Indo-European uh, um, uh, origin, it is one of the oldest Indo-European words to make it into the Assyrian language. And her close association of cannabis, you know, makes it hard not to see this uh, depiction of these offerings, uh, likely not a, a, an agent depiction of offerings of cannabis to this agent, uh, an influential goddess who is married longer than our civilization has existed. And, uh, uh, for thousands of years, she was worshipped. Yeah. That this ritual indication was used for entheo uh, purposes is pretty clear. An Assyrian medical tablet from the Louvre collection has it that so that God and, of man and man should be in good rapport with hellbore, cannabis, and lupine, you will rub him. So cannabis was thought to open one's ear up to God. And this is uh, interesting, this particular passage, in relation to uh, Hebraic references to cannabosum that were first looked at by the Polish etymologist Sula Bennett in the 1930s. And uh, Sula Bennett suggested that uh, there was a Hebrew word for cannabis, uh, um, cannabosum and that this was mistranslated uh, into Calamus when the Hebrew texts were first translated into Latin, and this mistranslation followed through in later uh, um, translations. And when you look at the, like, what she did is she followed the modern word cannabis back through history and traced it back to this, uh, this Hebrew reference, showing that this had been the same, uh, same name that had been used and it had come down. And when you take a look at the Assyrian name for Kanabu and its similarity uh, uh, um, phonetically to Kanabu, Bossum, uh, it becomes pretty strong, but then when you take a look at the way that it was both used to summon the voice of gods in, in both accounts, it becomes even more of a strong parallel. Um, and 
Oh, I should point out, this is an Assyrian uh, necklace, too, that has cannabis on it. Uh, this is uh, a, a, a page from Ari Kaplan, a well-known uh, uh, late rabbi, uh, and his uh, book on the Torah. And he talks about the, uh, the connection to cannabis and cannabosum via the cognate pronunciation. Um, and uh, uh, th the first of these references, there's about five or six of these references in the Old Testament, uh, Exodus 30, 23, God, who first appears to Moses and flames a fire from within a burning bush, commands Moses to make this holy anointing oil with about six to nine pounds of cannabis mixed with myrrh and cinnamon into about a gallon and a half of olive oil. And every time that Moses is to speak to the Lord, he goes in what is referred to as the tent of the meeting, kind of like the Hebrew version of one of these Scythian tents, but maybe a little more elaborate, getting kind of somewhere between the Assyrian and uh, uh, Scythian version. And he would cover himself in this oil, and THC's fatty soluble, myrrh and cinnamon would increase blood flow uh, um, and uh, make the uh, 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 THC more uh, able to penetrate the skin better. But he would also place some of this oil on the altar of incense to make the incense burn because incense was very primitive in those days. Um, and then he would actually speak to the Lord, according to the biblical account, in the pillar of smoke over the incense altar. The pillar of smoke was referred to as the Shekinah and represents the physical presence of God in the temple. Um, and uh, I'm not going to go into all the biblical references here and the story of cannabis and how it filtered into Gnosticism because it's a, a subject that's worth a, a lecture on its own. But uh, in the fourth century, as Dr. Hillman mentioned, uh, carbonized uh, cannabis was found at the site of a, 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 a woman who had died in childbirth. And also in glass vessels at this same site, there was some sort of cannabis preparation that had been contained in these uh, preparations. And, uh, um, you know, I think that uh, this role of cannabis uh, in religion is really... Uh, going to play a pivotal point at some time in the study of religion, al along with other entheogens, because uh, what it shows, I think, in a lot of ways is that uh, the study of entheogens, and you know, uh, uh, um, uh, my, 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 my good friend Carl Rucker, who was one of the people who helped c came up with this term, entheogen, which means the spiritual use of these substances that God created within, how they inspire us. Uh, uh, the anthropological, archaeological study of the entheogens, I think, is as much a threat to what is fundamental religion, and we can see what fundamental religion is doing to our modern world, as the myths of Genesis were to the, uh, 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 as Darwin's theory of evolution was to the myths of Genesis, because what they reveal is the classical anthropological development of religion via shamanism and the psychoactive use of uh, uh, plants for shamanism, for shamanic re revelation. And this is something that believers in the Bible have tried to shut down whenever they've come into contact uh, with it, whether it be the four century and the inception of the dark ages and the uh, closing down of pagan cults like what Dr. Hillman talked about or competing Christian Gnostic cults which use these substances uh, up to the medieval burnings of witches for using psychoactives uh, uh, in a lot of ways similar to what Dr. Hillman was talking about again in broomsticks with anointed uh, uh, with psychoactive substances uh, and, and, and used uh, via vaginal uh, areas. Uh, and into the new world where uh, the indigenous cultural use of peyote, the sacred mushroom, the ayahuasca has been persecuted into non-existence. So it's really important that we start to get this information out and I think it off offers us a cultural paradigm and can free us from the fetters of these old world views and help us into the dawn of a new millennia. I've got about uh, 10 minutes for questions before Carl Ruck comes up. And if you want to ask any questions to Michael or Cynthia who didn't have time or Ted, you can uh, shoot those questions at anybody in particular. And use the mic. <laughs> First, I want to say how much fun it is that in our old age and dotage, we are still learning. We are still focused. The one thing I found out after 40 years of being a cannabis historian is this tunnel vision. You start with looking up stuff about marijuana, and pretty soon you're in every human endeavor. You're in everything in history that has ever amounted to anything, and you got there the same way you do when you get stoned and try to read a text. 
I call it STML versus long-term memory gain. STML means you can't remember the start of the sentence, and the, re the reason for that, Andy Weil was the first one to point this out. The re I'm sorry for a oh, comment, but it's yeah, leading to a question. Yeah. Uh, the, the reason you forget the start of your sentence by the time you finish the thought is what I call tangential thinking, which is the main mental effect of marijuana and has led to its creativeness. You start here with a sentence and that suggests something else and you go over there for a minute and then pretty soon you're over here with that thought having led to that thought. And by the time you go through this whole process, that's how we learn. That's how we learn new things. And I am so happy that I'm still learning at the age of 70. When I started studying cannabis history long, long ago, my question is about Sarianidi and fermentation of ephedra. Mm -hmm. Sarianidi claims several times in his articles that the ephedra used in Soma, and perhaps the cannabis as well, was prepared through the process of straining, grinding, macerating, and straining that you described, but then was stored in vessels inside the temple before it was distributed, giving it time enough to ferment. Um, those of us who do not think that Soma was fermented yeah. uh, consider that there wasn't time between when it was prepared and when it was handed out. Uh, but the, I think the truth is we don't really know how long it was kept inside the temple before it was distributed. Any ideas? Well, I, I think for one thing that the uh, would have been psychoactive right off the bat, but uh, Dr. Ethan Russo and others are saying that this was like probably more like a fermented like kefir-like beverage, the Russian uh, yogurt drink. Um, yeah, well, it's, you know, it's kind of unknowable. I don't know that they could tell it was fermented from the sediment or anything like that because it would have <laughs> fermented long before it had uh, become uh, fossilized. Um, yeah, I don't know. But, you know, mentioning ephedra is pretty interesting because uh, ephedra has been found at some of these uh, turpan uh, uh, mummy finds up in China that, as well as cannabis. And in China, um, uh, 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 cannabis and ephedra have this relationship of kind of like a yin-yang type situation. Uh, uh, the cannabis is known as Huang Ma, but the ephedra is known as Ma Huang. And the Federa is known for its energy and cannabis more for its relaxing properties. And so the uh, use of the two uh, 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 probably may have even originated in China and then filtered into uh, uh, Bactria margiana. And I saw recently a, uh, a Russian archaeologist was talking about some uh, um, Aryan sites that they were rebuilding and uh, making into kind of like a living museum. And he was saying they as well prepared this uh, same beverage with cannabis and ephedra. Uh, I'm not sure if they're basing this on some archaeological find on Russia or if he's making a conjecture based on Serenadi's discovery, but it was in like the Russian Russian news and whatnot recently. Um, and uh, the Haoma rituals, uh, uh, they were often like staying up all night and partying and doing ritual sex and slaughtering animals and a lot of that type of stuff. And so probably the ephedra was used for that purpose to make the ability to enjoy the high well into the wee hours of the night. Any more questions? So, in in much of the aphroditic preparation of the their sacrament, for lack of a better word, there's usually opium mixed in with it. Mm -hmm. So it looks like to me, it looks like it's hash plus opium, and they give this to girls, according to Ovid, on their wedding nights. Well, and probably I'm just going to leave it to you that. to tell me w why. Well, probably if they were virgins, it probably would uh, aid in the pain of deflowering and uh, uh, open the gates, have you, a little bit, you know? Right, why together? Because oh, they're always together. The, yeah, the, what yeah. It looks like the hash. And, and, uh, well, cannabis is used in a number of uterine preparations, like medicinally, even into the 19th century right. for uterine contractions, and it's been used in childbirth and stuff like that. So right. that's probably for that effect. And then the opium may be directly for more like a direct pain effect as well. Uh, I really don't know a lot about the transdermal effects of opium, so yeah. I can't really, I'm not qualified to comment on that really. Yeah. It's fascinating, though, isn't it? That mm -hmm. So that there's, there's got to be some reason that they were... Yeah, yeah. well, right. dealing with pain in the agent world was a major issue, just like it is now, and these yeah. substances were considered gifts to the gods uh, yeah. 
for those people in pain, for sure. Yeah. Any questions for anybody else before we move on to the next speaker? Okay, well, we'll get Carl Ruck ready, and then we'll uh, be up with our keynote speaker here in a minute. <laughs> 